Welcome to the Ableton and Music Habits Podcast, episode 54. Welcome to the Ableton and Music Habits Podcast, actionable music production tips to take your music to the next level. And now, your host, Jason Timothy. Hey guys, and welcome back to the podcast. So I wanted to kind of share with you in this, what's going to be a pretty long podcast, about what I learned from a whole year of making music pretty much daily and how that led to me finishing about a song per week. I finished 50 songs and I wanted to get real about what it took to accomplish that, some habits that I continue to use today because of that experience and some of the things that you can do to dramatically increase your musical output while keeping the quality of your work either as high as it is now or in most cases, even at a higher level than where you're at now because of all the things you learn on the journey. So with that, let's uh, go ahead and get started. Now, for some of you, finishing 50 songs in a year might not seem that staggering. There's some people that finish a song every couple days if they want to. And if that's the case, that's really awesome. And you probably don't need this episode of the podcast. But uh, for me, it was a real revelation that transformed my music production. And using this to help others, it's helped you know thousands of aspiring producers that I've come into contact with uh, to do the same. So if you're still struggling to finish what you start in a way that makes you proud, then let me share a few things that helped me get to this level with my own music. And hopefully it'll help you. Now, some of this might sound a bit familiar as I went into the actual step-by-step process in my book, The Process for Electronic Music Producers. Um, And you can grab that on Amazon. Soon I'll have the audiobook version, but you can get that either as digital or physical book. But this is not an excerpt from the book, but it covers some of the same territory And I go off in a little bit of a different territory in this podcast. So let's go ahead and get started here. First and foremost, you want to think about music making as a process instead of a collection of techniques. There's a lot of cool techniques and tricks out there. And, you know, we all love them. But I discovered that techniques just don't finish songs. What I've found is that typically the more techniques you have in your head, without a home, without a purpose, the more confusion you stand to face. It's like collecting hundreds of spices but having no idea what you're trying to cook. And the solution to that is not more spices, which sadly that's what most producers do is they go after more techniques if the hundreds or thousands of techniques that they have consumed don't seem to be working. If we go back to the spices scenario, uh, this collection of spices gives you so many options of what to prepare that you can't really make up your mind. On top of that, for me, I realized I didn't even have the fundamentals needed to make anything at all. So I, I was just, I just had a head full of techniques, but no real process. If you wanna finish music, you need to understand both the fundamentals of a track and the process. And when I say process, Yes, we're talking about creating some limitations. We have to do this to focus on what is important. This doesn't mean that I'm attempting to stifle your creativity or your, your, your own unique sound. In fact, you need to understand that a unique sound does have limitations and boundaries. For example, you can bake a million different types of cakes and you can absolutely craft something that's unique, creative, and totally delicious. But that's because of the focused limitations of the actual process of making a cake. It's only when you've perfected how to make a cake that's been made over the centuries that you can truly explore more innovative ideas. This is kind of how you want to look at music. Before crafting the song that makes all the music nerds gush with envy, you need to craft a simple three chord tune. Complexities only work when they're built on a collection of simpler fundamentals that you understand. So it's more important to successfully finish something simple. And then by mastering this, you'll understand the reasons 
why you might want to explore more complex ideas. Because you'll be able to break down those complex ideas into their simpler fundamentals. You'll begin to learn that both simple and complex ideas are crafted from a very similar process. You may have heard the saying that it's best to learn the rules so that you can break them for the right reasons. And I find this mostly true. Although happy accidents can be the basis of some of your favorite tracks, the reason they work is by and large because you've gained the understanding of how to make it work by your knowledge of the recipe you've developed for your craft. When I started playing guitar, albeit pretty poorly, many moons ago, my goal was never to be a great guitarist. My goal was always, okay, I've learned these two chords, let's see if I can make a song with them. And everything I did in the future was always focused on songs, not a specific instrument. Now, I'm not saying one approach is better than another, but I will say that you tend to go down one of two roads. You either go in the direction of musician or the direction of songwriter. You can certainly be both, but usually you're going to learn more to one side than the other. Just understand if your main goal is to be a proficient musician, it'll likely take you longer to become a great songwriter. This is why there are complete novice musicians who make songs that are more palatable, memorable, and intriguing than some of the brilliant musicians out there. You don't need to be a great musician to be a great producer and vice versa. For example, Kurt Cobain was not an amazing guitarist. Original, yes, but there were plenty who played better, but very few were capable of crafting songs that connected to so many people. And just so we're clear here, I'm not qualified to make you a better musician, but I believe I can help you to craft and finish more songs you can be proud of. So focus on process first if you want to get better at the skill of music production. It's not that complicated once you get it down, but it does take practice, effort, and focus. The more of the unnecessary that you can cut out, the better off you'll be. This brings us into daily practice. If you've followed any of my work in the past, you're probably sick of hearing this, but daily practice is truly the biggest secret to becoming a confident and proficient producer. What makes a great producer is that they have run into a thousand more challenges than you and I and have learned how to navigate through them without losing momentum. By showing up daily, I was exposing myself to patterns that became more and more familiar. When I would stop my daily practice, it would tend to take more time for my brain to recognize and build upon these patterns and insights. When you've done something difficult enough time, the brain starts to relax and think, we've gotten through this before, we can totally do it again. Then solving those challenges becomes more of like a second nature without all the stress that you normally face when you're starting a new challenge. Every day you do the work is another day of confidence building, of not being afraid of failure or a bad day. Daily practice improves your skills exponentially. Let me explain that. So let's say you're working on music for 100 non-consecutive days, and each day you work on music, you get 1% better. That would make you 100% better after 100 days of work. But when you work daily, let's say you're not only adding that 1% per day, but also adding 1% from the previous days because you're remembering all of the habits that you're developing over time because you keep using them. So say by day 20, you wouldn't be 20% better, you'd be closer to 25% better. And this number would just keep compounding over time every day you continue your daily practice. That's why it's so important to do your best to practice your art every day if possible, because it will compound. Whereas if you just have little chunks of time, you're only getting incrementally better. You're still getting better, but you're gonna forget some of the connections you made last week or last month or six months ago. So definitely something to keep in mind. And I'm not attempting to quantify exactly how much better you'll get every day, but just giving you an idea of the difference daily work can make in your progress over time. Personally, I found this to be pretty accurate, if not a bit conservative in my own experience. The next big thing for me was getting organized. Getting organized was an enormous contributor to finishing songs more quickly and helped me maintain or even improve on the quality of my work. Here's some of the steps I took 
to go from unorganized mess to a more or less well-oiled music making machine. I first and foremost listen to music in my style or similar enough to my style. And I listen to particular songs as well as DJ mixes. And I would take notes on the types of sounds that worked best within the style. The tone of the kick drum, the other drums, the bass tone, the pads, stabs, synths, atmospheres, percussion, and then the types of effects or filters that were used. I took notes describing each sound in detail. Were they long sounds or short sounds? Metallic or wooden sounds? Hard or soft? Dry or wet? Bright or warmer? I used as much detail as possible using descriptions that made the most sense to me. And this gave me a list of the types of sounds that I needed for my style. Not only does it get me laser targeted on my sound, but it also cuts out all the cool but unnecessary things that aren't gonna help me accomplish my own thing. Next, I started making my go-to drum kits, bass sounds, synths, and everything. So I'm, I'm building presets that I can go to really quickly that gives me you know, the sounds that I want. And normally what I'll do is I'll, I'll first go through presets and see if I could find something that comes close and then I can tweak those sounds to my liking and get it as close as possible to the sound I'm going for. After that, then I'll save it and rename it with the preset 000 because zeros will always come to, to the top alphabetically. So it's easier for me to find my go-to sounds at the top of searches when I'm looking for a certain sound. And that just makes it a lot faster and much more convenient. The third thing I do is I create a basic default chain of my most commonly used effects. So I don't have to hunt them down and drag them in on every single track separately. I'll also have each effect kind of ready to go with the most common settings as like a default. If you don't know what that is yet, just update as you go. In, in other words, you might not know what your go-to effect presets are gonna be set to until you've produced a few songs. But every time you produce a new song, you're gonna kind of get a chain of effects and know what you're using most commonly. And then you could kind of turn those into like a default chain for yourself that just show up on every new track you make. And that's just gonna speed up your process. You may have separate ones for your drums and separate ones for your bass sounds and so forth, but this is just gonna make it much, much easier for you to dial in the sounds that you're going for so that you can really busy yourself more with constructing your song instead of having to start from scratch on building sounds that'll actually work. Some of the effects that I will use most commonly as a default in each track that I create is gonna be EQ, compression, delay, reverb, some sort of distortion or saturation, and probably a transient shaper. So having those ready to go just makes it very, very quick. So you don't need to stop your work, find the plugin and drag it in as you need it. It's also really important to organize your sample folder so it's not just a bunch of random sounds in one big folder. You know, kind of organize it into your separate drum sounds and bass sounds and synth sounds and atmospheres. That way you can much more quickly get to those sounds that are gonna inspire you and work for your music. You can also make separate folders that are just like inspiring sounds that you want to use in a song so that you can go immediately to that folder and see if any of those inspiring sounds will work in, in what you're currently working on. So taking the time to set this up for yourself is something you'll thank yourself for later. I mean, it does take some time in the beginning, but it's completely worth it because it's always going to be ready for you in the future. And the faster you can go from idea to action, the better. It'll also keep you from second guessing every decision because you've already done the hard work. Next, let's get into inspiration and references. So inspiration is rarely something that comes out of nowhere. Inspiration is more commonly a reaction to something that sparked your imagination. So with this in mind, the more input you can expose yourself to, the more things will spark your creativity. Many producers, I find, make the mistake of thinking every idea has to come through isolation in order to be original, and they cut themselves off from all the great art around them. The truth for me is that most of the greatest songs are an adaptation 
and a combination of other artists that came before them, were all standing on the shoulders of giants. And the wheel has already been perfected, so trying to reinvent that fundamental aspect is pretty futile. I think that originality is more about perspective. If you look at it the same thing others have looked at, but in a completely different way. I think this is why sampling the work of others can make some of the most original and unique ideas. I look at us less as inventors of ideas and more that our job is simply to repurpose those ideas that we hear around us and look at it from a different perspective. If you wanna make a lot of music, you have to keep allowing yourself to be inspired. For me, this came through music, art, conversations, movies, nature. I, I really kept myself open to just about anything. Even the things that other people said is cheating I immediately open myself up to it because I'm like, well, that's an avenue that everyone is cutting themselves off from. So if I open myself up to that from my own perspective, I just have a wider range of inspiration to draw from. Cutting off a source of inspiration because you think it's cheating is more of a cheat to yourself. If you wanna stay inspired, never cut off the constant flow of energy around you. I think each of us were born with originality and taste and anything that flows through us is gonna have our own energy stamp on it. So stop being afraid, and I think you'll accomplish a whole lot more. And I think your stuff will come out a lot more original than you expect. Next, let's get into planned accidents. I discovered over time that it was really important to separate my sound design and experimentation days from my song crafting days. Sound crafting is kind of a rabbit hole that would not only slow down my productivity, but also I would lose the plot with the song I was working on. Sound designing is about exploring all the possibilities, while producing is about making fast choices. So it was a huge revelation when I realized that these two mindsets don't work well together. I found that it's much easier to set up session times for each separately. And this is where planned accidents kind of come into play. For me, planned accidents are setting up scenarios for unexpected things to happen. There's a few ways I'll approach making interesting sounds that I can later cut up and use on my song construction days. So keep in mind that I fully expect a lot of what comes out of these experimental sessions is gonna be garbage. And we're just looking for those unexpected gems. The things I like to explore in these idea sessions is extreme time stretching, granular effects, and also just simply reversing sounds. This is really great for repurposing samples or audio from a track you're already working on. You never really know what's gonna happen, and that's the beauty of it. You just kind of stay open to whatever happens. Another approach that I take is I'll grab a synth that I'm not really familiar with, drag it in, and drag in an assortment of interesting effects. And next I'll create long and short MIDI notes that I'll just kind of keep on loop. And I keep everything one note, maybe playing different octaves, but this makes it a lot easier when dropping into a sampler. I know what note everything is on, so it's much easier to correct the notes that I'm gonna play later. So while looping the MIDI part, I'll send the audio output of this MIDI track to another audio track so I can just record everything that happens. Then I just hit record and twist all the synth parameters, you know, and I turn on and off all the different groups of effects. And I try to do things I wouldn't normally do to see, just to see what happens. I also like to automate things with LFOs and get a bunch of parameters just moving on their own. So I'll keep recording and tweaking things, you know, for like 30 or 40 minutes, and then I'll cut up the audio bits that I'm inspired by. And now I have a bunch of unique sounds no one's ever heard that I can pull into my track on my next music making session. And this works so much better for me than trying to make interesting sounds in the middle of a session. If you haven't tried this approach, I definitely recommend it. I think it'll save you a lot of time and give you a lot of inspiration that you wouldn't really expect. So how did I make so many songs? Well, I'll be completely honest with you, not all the songs I finished were started from absolute scratch. During this, I was able to tackle a bunch of unfinished songs that I just wasn't able to make any headway with. I did a few collaborations with people, so that took a little bit of the work off my plate. And then of course there's uh, doing remixes where most of the sounds 
are already there and the structure of the song is already there. So all you're doing is kind of playing with it and expanding on what's already there, which is a lot easier than starting from scratch. I don't think that I would have been able to finish a song per week for a full year if every song was started from scratch. So I absolutely took advantage of unfinished songs in my archives. And the difference, however, was that I'd gained a lot of production momentum and became much better at problem solving and making quick decisions. Most of the reasons I wouldn't finish a song in the past is either because I had too many ideas going on and couldn't decide a direction, or the track just lost its original spark and I didn't know how to retrieve it. What made a big change for me was to look at the mess of ideas and just pick one. Even if it might be the wrong choice, I realized that it didn't really matter what I picked. What mattered is that I committed to seeing that idea to the end. So instead of agonizing over all the twists and turns I thought I needed to prepare for in advance, I changed my attitude about things. I thought, what if a great song is just one idea kept interesting for five to six minutes? And this got me out of the mindset that I had to overthink where the song is supposed to go. I'd simply let a part play until I felt something needed to happen. And then I would do just enough to regain my interest for another four to eight bars. Of course, sometimes it feels necessary to take your song in a new direction for a bit, but you should feel it instead of forcing it. You'd be surprised how simple uh, a great song can be, and I believe it's because you make a decision at the beginning of your main groove, and this kind of becomes home for the song. And then your song is simply about leaving and returning to home. And once I made this discovery, finishing tracks became much easier. With collaborations and remixes, once again, both are great because you can bounce ideas off another person when you get stuck and learn some workflow ideas from another person that you might not have considered. The kind of going back and forth keeps you from hitting burnout on a track. And, you know, obviously remixes are great because you've already got a lot of the sounds and a basic structure to start from. And don't get me wrong, I didn't do this as a strategy to finish more songs. It was just simply when I was inspired and needed a break from starting a song from scratch, this just helped keep moving me forward. The important thing though is just that you make sure that the person you're collaborating with is actually in the habit of finishing tracks as well because you don't want to be waiting on someone who never had any intention to finish what you both had started. Next, I wanted to share a technique that I use for turning one song that you're working on into two or three songs. So this technique can work amazingly well uh, to finishing more tracks. I started getting in the mindset of thinking of EPs instead of singles. Because if I wanted to get signed to a label, they usually need two songs at the very least. Normally three songs and a remix or two songs and two remixes. So this means if you want to get signed to a label, you need more than one song that fits what the label wants. So if they like one track and not the other, this is going to hurt your chances of getting signed. So your job is to make two to three songs that sound similar enough that if they like one song, they're gonna like all of them. So my approach to this is to work on one song until I have a solid basic groove, just with drums and bass. And then I'll take that whole groove and I'll copy and paste that eight bar loop kind of further down my arrangement, you know, in the empty space part of the project. And then I'll just write a new bass line using the same sound and the same drum groove. And remember, this new bass line is not supposed to sound like a variation of the song you're already working on. This is supposed to sound like it could potentially be a new song altogether. So you might need to listen to other songs to get inspired and change your mindset of a, a whole different bass line. And these can be starter points for your next track. That way you've already got your bass sound and you've got your basic drums, you know? It's gonna make things a lot faster because all you have to do then is switch out some of the drum sounds, change some of the drum pattern, and you know, the bass sound's already gonna be mostly dialed in, and you're often running in a, in a new direction, but it's similar enough in tone that if the label likes your first song, they're gonna, probably gonna like this one as well. So then your job is just to fill out the melodic parts and the arrangement, and you could almost have an EP written as quickly as it normally takes you to write just a single track. Think of it kind of like this. When you're in a band, 
you've got one bass player. And the bass player, you know, especially when you start off, bass player's got one bass, one amp. So they're using the same sound, and that could kind of become the signature sound of the band. So there's no real reason that you need to reinvent your bass sound with every single track. For me, when I was finishing a lot of songs, my bass sounds were kind of based on probably five different sounds that I developed over time. And that's never been an issue for me. Plus I know how to process those five sounds really well. So every time I finish a new song, I get even better at making my bass sound better and better. So I'm gaining more experience and I'm getting better and better instead of trying to reinvent from scratch. You never really get better at creating that particular tone. Next, real quickly, let's get into arrangement. So arranging my songs used to be like my, my biggest nemesis. I would agonize for ages on it and still wouldn't be happy at the end of it. And this took a ton of my creative energy that was better served focusing on other aspects of my music making. So I was thinking there's gotta be a better way, a simpler way. And what I've learned is there totally is. I just decided to start stealing arrangements from tracks that I liked. You know, not, not stealing the music at all. I just wanted to know where their breaks were. So what I'll do is I'll stretch out my eight bar groove, my eight bar loop for the length of this reference track. And obviously you wanna make sure that your reference track is warped to the same tempo. Otherwise this, this trick won't work. But from there, I'll just mark my breaks by simply removing the kick drums in those areas. And this will make it easier for me to locate where something needs to happen in your track. So basically, once you figure out your intro, which is just a stripped down version of your groove, and your outro, which is pretty much the same, you're left with only sorting out like three or four sections to make changes in your song, because after a break, something new needs to happen or something needs to be removed from your song. Maybe you need to simplify after a break, but you'll feel it after that break. And then you can work after you get your arrangement kind of dialed in, you can work on your breaks and your builds. And from there, you're really, really close. Then you can always just, if a break needs to be longer, just double the time of it and then work that out. Or if a certain section seems to, to need to be shorter or longer in any part of your song, you can dial that in. But this arrangement trick just takes away all the guesswork and gives you some place to start. And I find it works really, really well. And I don't use the same structure in songs. I just, every song, I copy from a new structure and it, it kind of pushes me to think about arrangement in a different way for each song. So it keeps me arrangement wise more original. So lastly, I wanted to get into what to do with motivation when you feel like you're failing. Because what I've found when producing consistently is about once every couple months, I'd go through some really rough days creatively where I just feel like I'm total garbage and nothing's working, and I feel like it's not gonna work. And it's just a full meltdown, you know? And it's really terrifying because you just feel like you've lost whatever you've gained in your ability. Like you literally feel like you're not capable of making good music. Like whatever you had was, was just a streak of luck, and now your luck's run out. I mean, these, these are just those times that make you kind of question everything, and it can really put you in a depression if you're not careful. And what I realized is that the only way to handle these situations is to just push through and continue showing up every day. You know, it's gonna be harder on these days, but you just need to sit down and continue doing the work, regardless of your emotion. And usually what I found is within three to four days, you start to see a light at the end of the tunnel. And surprisingly, some of my biggest breakthroughs are the result of these experiences. In fact, some of these hopeless songs became some of my favorites in a lot of cases, probably because they were a mental stretch into unfamiliar territory. So through this challenge, I pushed myself to be bigger than I was before. So the biggest lesson that I can share with you is just stay the path and know that the dark days will pass. From my experience, they always pass. So to kind of wrap this up, when you put your focus on finishing what you start, you can make some of your most valuable discoveries. And not every tune's gonna be a banger, and that's totally okay. But when you stack up your results over a period of time, you'll 
very clearly see how far you've come. And this is something that you'll always be able to be proud of. So as you explore your process, my hope is that my experience can give you some inspiration and hope. So with that, happy music making, and thanks so much for sticking around. So there you have it, guys. I hope that you continue to get great information from this podcast. And if you do, please share it, subscribe, you know, all that different stuff. And if you are looking for more information on these types of subjects, you can find two of my books on Amazon. One is called The Mental Game of Electronic Music Production, and the other is called The Process for Electronic Music Producers. If you've never worked with me before and you'd like to sit down and see if I can help you, you can feel free to schedule a one-on-one session with me. I won't charge you for the first session that we sit down. All you gotta do is go to musicsoftwaretraining.com forward slash application and answer a few questions and then we can discuss how I might be able to help you further. So with that guys, have a fantastic one. I'll see you in the next one.